Amen. What a blessing. You know, that, I love that because um, if you've ever got to visit the sea or the ocean, uh, you'll understand what that uh, joy is about because about the time you think the sea has calmed down, here comes another wave. And that, if you're truly in the will of the Lord, uh, that's just how it is. You always find something new to be joyful about. And uh, you know why people, born again people, are miserable today is because the devil has you where he wants you. And uh, we have to be very cautious of that. If you have the, your Bible with you, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 20 is where we'll be taking our text. And while you're turning there, uh, we want to, uh, with the church's permission, uh, do things a little bit different after church. We're going to move the business down, business meeting down to the very end of the day because there's some items, more uh, scheduling items that have to be done, uh, and I want to be sure I have them all written down, and I don't yet. Uh, one thing, just and this is a minor example, is buying pizza for Wednesday night when Brother Philip and his family are here. Um, so um, everybody will eat at the church at that night and appropriating funds and stuff for just little things like that but I want to be sure I have it all together uh, Gospel of John chapter 20 and we're going to begin reading in the very uh, first verse John chapter 20 in the first verse the Bible says the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark Unto the sepulchre, and see if the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went in into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin was, that was about his head, not laying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which first came to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went again, away again unto their own home, but Mary, without at, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and see of two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of, the G of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto him, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I knew not, and I know not where they have laid him. And she said, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou born him hence, tell me where whence thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. I'll be preaching this morning on the thought, when you look in, what do you see? Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we praise you for sitting rightly on the throne this morning and doing thing after the counsel of your own will, needing nothing more than yourself for all the problems of the world, all the answers to this life. Lord, we praise you for that. Lord God, we pray for our meeting that's coming up, Lord, that you would be magnified in it. Lord, we know if we would lift you up and that we would glorify you and that we would uh, sing your praises, Lord, that would be enough. But, Lord, we pray that you would meet with us. God, please bless Brother Philip, Lord, that you would fill him uh, with your spirit. That's what we need, Lord, is a spirit-filled meeting. Lord God, we pray for that. 
Lord, meet with us this morning. Honor your word to the hearts of those that believe. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Now, uh, when you look at something, many people see it in different, very different ways. Um, I know years ago when I worked for the ambulance service, I would hear the officers at car wrecks asking, uh, what happened? And every one of them would have a different story. And, you know, I've even seen hit and runs where the vehicle would be described totally differently. You know, some would say it was red, some would say it was white, and some would say it was a green, and not really seeing it for what it is. You know, uh, we have to be very careful of our perception. You know, sometimes just because we see something, we think we know what it's all about, and many times we do not. We need to understand everything that we see in the context of Scripture. First of all, you look at it in the light of the truth of the Word of God, and then you go from there. You know what? Uh, when, when, when things begin to happen, don't get upset, because you know what? Everything is under God's feet. Everything. Well, why would you be upset? Why would you get tore up? But we'll say, see that these people, three godly people, really saw three different things. And the one that you think would see the most really saw the least. And many times spiritually, that's exactly in the approach that we can we come. Uh, in the first verse, back in 20, uh, 20 verse 1, the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. Now, uh, we're not going to read it today for time's sake, but in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, it... <coughs> Excuse me. It identifies this Mary, Gospel of Luke chapter 8, verse 2, as of whom was cast out seven devils. And you know, that is a very much a reality, is demon possession. And, and you know, uh, a lot of times we want to see the little pointy ears and all the foolishness that goes with demonic possession today. Nothing farther could be from the truth. That's a Catholic forest. You know what demons get a hold of people? Pornography. You know what kind of demons get a hold of people is alcohol. You know what kind of demons get a hold of people is, is wasting their entire life. That's the demons of this world. And it says of Mary, she had seven. And I don't know exactly what Mary's issues were, but I do know that she was demonically possessed seven times over. You know, over. You know what? That should make us shake in our shoes. But when you talk about demonic possession, it's just like water off a duck's back. When you look at them babies of yours and know that they can be demonically possessed, and it might get you a little upset about it. And, and so then we as the Lord's people uh, uh, ought to be very anxious to serve the Lord. So Mary Magdalene, this woman who was uh, delivered from demonic possession seven times over, the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene. Now, I also want to draw your attention, and I'll be quick, that the day that they are doing this is on Sunday. The first day of the week is Sunday. Now, if you'll follow the chain of New Testament the events after the resurrection, it would always say on the first day of the week. Uh, and it will say, and, and, and eight days later, which is how they counted one week, because they counted night as the beginning. And, and so you know what? We ought to meet together on Sunday. Don't let this seventh day bunch uh, take you aside even one little bit. The Lord's day is very different from the Sabbath day. It always has been. And, and so we find here that Mary was the very first one. She had an interest enough to do something for the cause of Christ. The first day of the week uh, come with Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and see if the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Now the Gospel of Matthew, the very same account of the very same event, said that that other Mary went with her as well. And uh, there was another woman that went with them. And they were going down to do some more work on the body. Now, they didn't embalm folks back then. And I don't know about you, but I've seen enough dead bodies on day three, I don't want to see them. Uh, you, know, you know what happens to flesh? You, there is nothing that stinks as bad as a rotten human. 
Um, if you've ever, uh, you know, I've seen rotten possums, and I know that you, you've got a little bump on them, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, deer is disgusting, but, you know, a rotten human smells worse. And, and you won't understand that until you've experienced it. I've told many of you, I worked a death call when I worked for the ambulance service down in Indian Mound, and a woman had been dead about 14 hours, and it was August. I mean, hot, hot August. Not a shy, little two two room house, not two bedroom, two room, a kitchen and a living room bedroom combo, and she'd been out there about fourteen hours with no air. Now, in all my years of nursing, in all my years as an EMT, that's the only time I ever threw up. But it made me so sick I threw up. Now they were going to that. What about you? You know what? I would really have to love someone and have an interest in them to do that. See, uh, what, 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 what this means is sometimes the Lord will ask very strange things of you. And it should be your willingness to do them. It'll be out of the normal. It'll be out of the routine. And so that's exactly what was uh, happening here and Mary was very willingly going. She discovers it, rolled back, and she doesn't look in. See, a lot of people meet, miss that about verse 1. She doesn't look the first time. She just sees it rolled back. And in fact, again, in the Gospel of Matthew, that became a discussion on the way down to the graveyard. Who will roll us back the stone? Remember that? And so, and instead of being excited about it, it scared her. You know what? Um, I think I'd have to go with the, with the Mary Magdalene course here. If I saw an open grave, I don't know that I would run to it. And I don't know that you would either. And, and, and so we find that she really doesn't even look. You know what you need to do? Take time this morning to look at yourself spiritually. You take time this morning to see that have you really been born again? Not, not, not just saying some kind of little foolish prayer. Has Christ spoke to you? Has the Holy Ghost made you new? You look at that real carefully. Uh, Mary ought to took a little time to check it out herself. But she didn't. You know what? This is, this is the truth of the modern day. The devil wants to keep you going at 100 miles an hour all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but by the end of the day, I'm pumped up it out. And that's where he wants you. He, he wants you that you, you, you have no energy left to spend in the things of God. That's where he wants you. Verse 2, She runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's how John always referred to himself. It's just that other disciple. And, and saith unto them, They had taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they laid him. Now, how did Mary ever come to that conclusion? Did somebody tell her that? Did the Holy Ghost give her some information? She came to that conclusion on her own. You be very, very careful to the conclusions you come to on your own. Because when it comes to spiritual things, unless you're on line with the Lord God, nine times out of ten, you're going to come up with the wrong conclusion. And that's exactly what she did. And again, remember, she didn't even look in there. And she came into this, you know what? They stowed him away. How did she ever get that? Did she stop and pray? Did, did, did she look unto the Lord? No. And, and many times what we need to really do as the Lord's people is just put it in park and begin to pray of the goodness of God. That's really what would have been her very best option. Verse 3, Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. So what was happening is John and Peter was running, and John was probably young enough really to be Peter's son, and he outrun him because of his youth, but when he got there, he didn't do that. 
nothing. How many people, when you get to church, you don't do nothing? How many people of you here pray for me after you get here? How many, how many of you pray for your Sunday school teachers? How many of you began to look into this book like it literally is the very written word of God? How many people you, of you arrive in that, in, in that thought process? That's where we ought to be. And, and so he got there but didn't do nothing. Have you ever got somewhere and just didn't even participate? Didn't even sing songs of praise. Didn't even, didn't even go before the Lord in prayer. And, and if we're not very, very, very careful, that's what we'll fall into. So the rebel, and he stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes, yet, he, yet went he not in. So he stoops down and looks in, and all he sees is the linen clothes, uh, the linen cloths, the, the wraps that they had put around the Lord Jesus. That's all he saw. You know what? When he looked off in there, have you ever wondered if the angels were sitting there? Did they manifest themselves only to Mary? Or did the other two have not enough spiritual sense to see them? And I'm not saying I don't, that I know the answer to this, but I, I, I will say this. You see, you see a thing in spiritual content exactly how you look at it. This meeting that's come up, you'll, if you think, hey, it's going to be another five-dayer, we'll get through it. Or you can see it as God is literally going to come down and meet with us. It, it, you will look at it one way or the other. And what you see in it will affect how it works. And, and so as Mary is looking down in there, all, I mean, excuse me, as John the Apostle is looking down, all I can see is some empty rags. All I can see is just some pieces in there. And I want you to see, because he was a good Jew, he wouldn't even go off down in there. Now, let me say this. The, the, the church of the Holy Sepulchre is not the burial ground of Christ. That's a Catholic farce. Don't you ever believe that? There's a different sepulchre there that a lot of people look at. And you know what? This is the truth. No one knows where it's at, right? And, and, and I'll go even further. Does it matter? No. It's certain, all I know is I can believe that word. They looked off in there and it was empty. And you know what? That's enough for me. That, that's all I need. But I do know this. The Lord God Almighty wouldn't have a Catholic whore church sitting on the very place he was resurrected. I do know that. And, and, and so we see then as the Lord's people that uh, maybe we need to be a little more aggressive. But he was a good Jew. Did you know it was a sin? For a Jew to touch a dead body, not even your mama. In fact, if you did that, then you then you had to be set outside the city for a whole week, seven days, and be purified. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, uh, sometimes we need to get rid of our religious hang-ups and get interested in what God's going to do. So that's why John wouldn't bail off in there, and that's why his view was very limited. You, you, you know why your view is limited of God? It's because you don't study yourself. You know why for many years my view of the Holy Ghost was somewhat limited? Because I believe what other people told me. Get in for it yourself. Yeah. The reason that John's view was limited is he didn't get in. And the reason he didn't get in he thought he was too good to. Right? And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, what we need to do is get out and get in and see Christ unto ourselves. Uh, do things right on eye to eye. Then cometh Simon Peter and followeth him and went into the sepulcher and see the linen clothes lie. That's exactly what John the Apostle saw. And the napkin that was about his head was not lying. 
uh, with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, I want you to see that when you get down in there, you can see things a lot better. So uh, they looked in, and, and all he saw, all John saw, was the, was the cloths wrapped up. And then when they, you know what, Peter just jumped right off in there. You know, uh, you follow the life of Peter. And you remember this about yourself. Nothing, nothing, I mean, I have nothing to compare to Peter. He was a great preacher. But Peter liked to be the boss. You be very careful. If you have that natural oomph, you be very careful of it. You, you know why he jumped off in there? Because he was big like Peter. I hope he had concern for Christ. I hope he was looking for the right things. But time and time again, who, who was the very one that said just four days before this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And within 12 hours, he said, I don't know the man. See, that was Peter. So Peter jumps off in there. But the good thing about it, because he got closer, he got to see something John hadn't seen. You know what? If it's your mind to get closer unto Christ this morning, you'll see some things other people don't see. You, you, you'll, you'll look at some things in a new, in a better way when you get in there and you really look. But again, there's some risk involved because you, you know what? We're so clean and healthy today, we don't want to smell the dead body. Right? Uh, you know what, it, it, it would be very, pretty brassy to jump in a tomb knowing that there's a body in there, wouldn't it? Most of us would not have the zeal to do that, again, because we're a little too clean for that, a little bit too above that, and what we need to do is just do it. Verse 8, then, then went in also that other disciple, he's Kind of, kind of went off Peter's bravery. Then went in that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. You know what? What, what a wonderful thing that those years of the uh, of the apostles when they looked and they beheld and they believed. You know that what Thomas said, "Blessed are thou." Uh, what the Lord said to Thomas, "Blessed are thou, Thomas, for Jonah, for you have seen and believed." But blessed be those that believe and have not seen. And so John the Apostle went in. And you know what? Notice this time, it did not say what he saw. It just said that he seen and he believed. I don't know if he saw the angels. I don't know if he just saw that napkin line over there. I don't know what he saw, but he got close enough that it made a difference. You, you know why we don't receive revival today? People don't get close enough. They are too hung up in this world. They are wondering what's on Facebook, wondering what's playing down at the, at the movie theater. They, they, they're wondering about this and wondering about that, and they don't have time to spend alone with Christ. And we wonder why there's revival, that, that we're lacking revival in the modern day. Well, I can tell you, that's why. And, and so we see then that whatever his whole perception, it changed and he believed. Verse 9, this is an unusual scripture. For as yet they knew not that the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now, notice what it says. They knew not the scripture that he wrote. But you know, you know, somebody did tell him Christ. In fact, it says, and he began to tell them what he must suffer, and that he must be that he must die and be raised again. You didn't know what the problem was? They wasn't listening. Just like ever. <laughs> One of us who are bad just have those little spots and just wasn't listening. It wasn't that they weren't told, it wasn't listening. Uh, you, know, you know what the very best thing you can do is always be attentive to the Word of God. Always be attentive to the Holy Ghost. Always be on the... On, that, that's why He told the churches there in the first three chapters of Revelation, He that have an ear, let him hear. 
you know, me and Brother Gina was talking after his class. Read this week for your for your scripture time, 1 Timothy chapter 3 again. Verse 6 says that none of that generation, that whole generation that went out with Moses died. And you know why they died? They didn't believe. Two people came out of that. The two that came out was Caleb and Joshua. 4.5 million people and two believers. You know what that says to me? Uh, today, a lot of things that we call believers probably ain't. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to be focused in on the truth that this Word gives us. And when the Lord tells us something, commit it. Get it up here. Verse 8. Then went in also the other disciple, which came to the first, and saw. And when he saw, he believed. For as yet they knew not the Scripture that, must, that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Now, I want you to get the, the full effect here, because really... Even though John says, yeah, you know, John believed, he saw it, and he, he believed in the resurrection. He believed, but they went home. You know what? I believe, I don't know, because uh, and maybe I'm just putting too much confidence in my flesh, but if I had found out that there was the living Lord Jesus Christ, the last thing I want to do is just to pack up and go home. You, you know what? I, I think it would have motivated me to look for Him. But I don't know, do you? Uh, I hope that it would. I hope that knowing Christ is living today will motivate you to serve Him. Uh, will motivate you to have an interest in what, what He is doing. But again, I don't know. Verse 11. Mary's second look. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. Now, at this point... Mary has still not even looked in. You, you know what the problem is with many believers today? They never look in. Listen, don't, don't you wait till I preach this whole book to you because I will mess you up. I will tell you something wrong. I will read something wrong. I will say something wrong. You get in here like the Bereans did in Acts chapter 27 and you study it out yourself for exactly what it says. And so even though, can you imagine when when uh, Peter and uh, uh, Peter and John came out and, and, and uh, John said, listen, he's gone. I believe he's risen. And Mary didn't even go in. Well, I can. Every day, every single Sunday, we meet here for a living, resurrected Christ in a town, just a town of Dover now, I think has like 2,500 people, and the county has almost 16,000 people in it. It's almost tripled in size in my lifetime. And you know what? Look at the handful of the here. That, that's no surprise to me. You, you had two of the apostles turn around and go home and they knew Christ. So Mary, Mary had still not looked in on what was going on. But Mary stood without the sepulcher weeping and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. What a wonderful, glorious thing. What a, what a hallelujah time when she finally to get a look for herself. You know what you need this morning? You need a look for yourself. Don't you trust what I say about Christ. Don't you trust what I say about the Holy Ghost. Don't you trust what I say about the church of God. You look for yourself. You look. You know what? And you know what? It takes some effort to do that. Did you know that? But really, that's why people don't do it. Let's be honest. Because it takes some effort. Now, I'm not very good at stooping. I finally have a reason. I have an extra vertebra back here. And uh, I, I've never been able to touch my toes. And I mean, I, I should be 50. And I always thought it's because I was stiff. And it's, uh, it's impossible for somebody with a back like mine. And you think it would be easier, but according to my chiropractor, you can't do it. So we'll go, we, we'll go with him. Uh, 
But stooping takes effort. And looking for Christ is going to take effort. Looking for the will of God is going to take some effort. That's why predestination and seek the Lord while He may be found, that's why they're both equivocally true. Every, both of them are true because it's your responsibility to look. You, you know why there's no young men preaching today? Listen, they're not looking. Don't you blame it on God's sovereignty. I don't want to hear it. They're not looking. It, 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 it takes effort and it takes some, uh, some, uh, some uh, little output of the flesh to stoop down. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stood down and looked in the se sepulcher. Now notice her view. And she seeth two angels in white, sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Now, my personal opinion is this, you take it for what it's worth. They were there the whole time. You know why? They weren't looking for him. Peter and John just wasn't looking for him. How many of you look for angels? Like you need your head examined, right? Well, I will say this. You'll never see one if you don't. You'll never see one if you don't. So they, 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 they looked down in there and there was an angel on this side and an angel down there and Mary looked in and, and, and she seen them. Well, what a glorious thing. They literally had been inside the tomb and they didn't see them. You, you know why, why they didn't see them? They had some spiritual issues. And you know why we don't see things today? Because we have some spiritual issues. Do y'all remember what the Lord Jesus, one of the very last things that He told Peter before the crucifixion? He said, Peter, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, was Peter saved? Yes, I believe he was. I don't think conversion has anything to do with salvation or redemption, either, either one. You know what? Converted simply means changed. And you know what? Over the last 30 years, my idea about that book has somewhat changed. What that book teaches me, I believe it's changed a whole lot. If you, if you told me 30 years ago that I believed in the election, I'd say, you need your head in. But I do. I believe from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And, and so, I had missed something along the way, hadn't I? And when they went into the sepulcher, because they weren't taking their time, and they weren't spiritually in tune, they missed it. And, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to sometimes begin to wander and think about the things that we missed. That, that somehow over the, the course of the events, we, we just lost it somewhere. We, we missed the big picture. Verse 13. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Now you see a little uh, hang up of Martha, I mean, excuse me, of Mary's flesh always wanting to see something. You know what? We don't know what Christ looks like. Don't let anybody... Well, I'll say this. First of all, He didn't have shoulder-length hair. That's one thing for sure. I'll tell you another thing that I believe uh, concerning how Christ looked at physically, I think is about like myself. He wasn't much to look at. That's what the Bible teaches, is it not? The Bible says He had no former comeliness. Right? And, and so, she had a hang-up on what she perceived as Christ. And we do too. That's why you little Catholic symbols and you little crucifixes and all that foolishness, that's why people get hung up on it. It's because the flesh likes things how they look, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I could say my first interest in Donna was how smart and, and, and how godly she was. But I'll be honest, the first thing I saw about Donna, she was pretty. 
I was interested. See, the, 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 the eyes of the flesh get you, uh, it is what, what the, and so don't get out of hung up. So when she looked in and she saw them two angels, they thought, that, she thought they were the gardeners. Uh, she wanted to know where Christ was at. And, and, and so that's why spiritually th spiritual things need to be spiritually discerned. We just don't know what they look like. Um, and she answers him, and, he, and, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, if you don't get anything else after, out of this message this morning, you get this one, underline that. She'd been with him three and a half years, and she didn't recognize him. And listen, it wasn't, and I believe bodily he probably had been changed. In fact, I think on the road of after Aramatha, he presented himself yet again in a different form to those two brothers. But, this is the thing. You will never see Christ until He reveals Himself to you. That, that, that's just the simple and plain truth. That's why accepting Jesus as your Savior is not in the Bible. Because you know why? It don't matter whether you accept it or not, Christ is on the throne this morning. It don't matter whether you accept it or not. God is sovereign. And the Bible says He does everything after the counsel of His own will. And He don't need your help. That's the God of the Bible. That's the one that nobody wants to deal with. Is a God that does everything that He wants to do when He wants to do it. That's the God of the Bible. He's not twisting His hands this morning hoping that you might do something. What kind of God is that? It is not even a God. But the God of the Bible is sovereign. And He's sitting up there this morning. And you know what? Things are going exactly like He wants them to. You know why that bunch of crazies is walking up through Mexico? Because God wants them to. The only thing I come down to. Right? See, that, 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 and, and so his marriage looking down, and God hadn't manifested himself to her. But one little word Mary. And she turned around and said, It's my God, Lord, and my God. See, that's the kind of experience you need with Christ is that He spoke to you, not that you spoke to Him. Think about it. Think about it. Has Christ ever spoke to you? I mean, really? I can say, blessed be the name of the Lord through the person of the Holy Ghost. My Lord has spoke to me time and time and time again, sometimes with that book and sometimes not with that book. Sometimes it just fills His presence about me. And I can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. That is meeting with God. And listen, a lot of what we do isn't. A lot of what we do, that old rigid book, Three songs and, and, and a prayer in Sunday school and three songs and preaching. You, you know, where do you find that in the Bible? You don't. That's the reality of it. You don't. And, and, and so then we as the Lord's people, what we have to measure ourselves against is this. Has He ever said your name? And if He's never spoke His name, your name, you know what? You're still lost. Now, you didn't have to hear it with this audible ear, but listen, if He hadn't manifested Himself to you individually, say what you will, you're still lost. Mm -hmm. And that, 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 that's a hard, bitter pill to swallow, but it's simply how it is. It's that there has to be a personal relationship for that to occur. I want you to go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, uh, excuse me, chapter 16, verse 13. Matthew 16, uh, verse 13. Matthew 16, uh, verse 13, the Bible says this. When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked, his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I, am, I, the Son of Man, am? 
And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, or that's Elisha, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto him, But whom do ye say that I am? Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. There's a lot being said about Christ outside this building today. Some of it good and some of it not so good. You know what some people say? That he was an ordinary man and nothing more. That's what some people will say. You know what some other people will say? He's a friend trying, trying to help you. And you know, both of them is just as wrong as two left feet. Because I've never known Christ to try anything that He didn't accomplish, did you? And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we ought to be glad that the Christ of the Bible is a lot more effective than this. So who do you say Christ is? Is Christ the Savior? Or does He want to be the Savior? Is He the Redeemer? Or is He trying to be the Redeemer? Which one is He this morning? Because listen, it does make a huge difference how you look at that, does it not? Either He's effective or He's not. Either, he's, either He gets the job done or all He does is try to get the job done. One or the other must be true. And then He says, Well, well apostles, whom do ye say that I am? And old Peter, and I personally believe this is where Peter was converted. And he, I mean, saved. And he messed up a lot after this, again and again. He reminds me of myself. But he said, Whom do ye say that I am? Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And man, if we could get a hold of that, that was a mouthful for the Jews to say, You know what? That was the Jews saying, you are Messiah. You're the answer of our, of our prayers. You're the deliverer. And I know that. And then, what does it say? He said, blessed are thou, Simon Berjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Does he ever, ever ask <laughs> Peter to repeat a prayer? Does he ever, ever ask, do you accept me? No, he says, you know why you got this, Peter? It's because God revealed it to you. You know what? That, 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 that's a measure of your salvation. Either you have it or you don't. Either it was something mustered up in flesh, or God just granted you redemption because of His goodness. There's no, there's no in-betweens. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we ought to be able to rejoice with Peter and, and know that He saved us. He came to us <laughs> when He came to me. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm going to read one more place and we're going to close. In the book of 1 Corinthians, um, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And listen, Corinth was in a mess. You know... Uh, we need to read these church letters like they were written to New Testament right. and uh, take them down. Because, uh, you know what, sometimes I would hover to thank the one that we would get. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. Paul writes, We have not received the spirit of this world, you know what the spirit of this world says? Uh, it says one or two things. I hate you, and I'm going to win. And that is the real message. That, that's what they believe. Or they say, Oh, it don't matter what you believe. We're all in this together. And then they stab you in the back. Right? That's not, that, that, that's not very pleasant preaching, is it? But it's just simply the truth. There's no way but unto Christ. The only way to be... You know, you know what I think about the pygmies in Africa? I think they need Christ. And I think they'll die and go to hell without Him. That missionary brother that just got killed. You know what? Somebody needs to go back to that African nation because of the, if they don't, those people are going to die and go to hell. And you know what? I don't care if they've never heard the gospel. They'll still die and go to hell. I, I believe that. Do you not? I, I fully, 
you know what? If I didn't believe that, I would be. I, I would say church business meeting today. I'd say let's suspend all the mission support because it don't matter to start with, right? But I, I believe it's necessary that we get the word out. And, and, and so, as he's writing here to the church at Corinth, he 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 said he he's very specific. Now we've not received the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us. So how do we know spiritual things from God? Verse thirteen. Which things also we speak not in words which, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And, and you know what? Uh, I, I don't have any formal education whatsoever as a preacher. In fact, I don't know that I'd buy into that if I could. But, I preach what I know. And let me say this, I could impress you Concerning my understanding of cellular osmosis and wound healing. But it don't mean a whole lot to you, does it? I mean, I talk to you, Jerry, you talk about losing some people on that one, you lose them. And justly so, because you know what? It don't mean anything. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And that's what today, that, that's what every focus of the church ought to be, is looking at these things in a spiritual eye. But listen, lost friend, you know what? You can't do that because you don't have a spiritual eye to see it with. You, you know what looks stupid to most people that you show up here every Sunday? Because they do not have a spiritual eye. You know what seems stupid to people for you to pay your tithes and offering? And they say all, all Larry wants is your money? It's because they do not have a spiritual ear. That, that, that is where they have been left. I also want you to see that it has to be te taught by the Holy Ghost. I can't do that teaching. Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now, you underline that when we're fixing to close. The natural man receiveth not the, the things of God. So, what has to come first? Is it, not, is it not salvation? Because it just said that the natural man can't receive them. So, if there's not redemption, there's no salvation. If he doesn't come to you... You're right where you're at. Let me ask you this, and we're going to close. Did the man that fell among thieves, and you listen to me, every one of us, you know what thieves do? They steal stuff from you. And the man, the man that fell among thieves, did he say one word? Help me, help me. And I, you read it this week, but I can already tell you, he did not. In fact, the Bible says the Samaritan went to him. You, you know what we need? <laughs> we need Christ to come to us. Even the redeemed need that. You know that? Even to say, you know, sometimes we get so bowled down with the filthiness of this world. What we need is Christ just to come to us. Just through the person of the Holy Ghost to encourage us and bring us around. What, what are you depending on salvation for? I'll say this, if you don't have a conversion experience, if you don't have experience with the Holy Ghost, you're still lost. And, and that may sound harsh, and that may sound mean, but I'm telling you the truth. Because anything else would have to be of us, right? And anything else would be inadequate. You, you know why baptism don't work? Because it's of us. You, you, you know why being good don't work? It's of us. You know why doing the Catholic humbo jumbo don't work? It's of us. So do you have something outside that? That's your need.